Yep, give me just a minute to get us live on YouTube, Mr. Chairman, and then we'll be good to go. Okay. You're good, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Well, hey, good morning. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, just call the meeting to order. It's not uh, it's not a true interim meeting. Uh, House members, thank, thank all of you for uh, taking the time to join us. And it's awesome to see our Senate partners uh, back again. A uh, good team with the uh, Wyoming Minerals Committee. And so this morning, what, what I wanted to do is we wind down this two week session here uh, is, you know, one of the pressing issues that we all know is what's been going on with the executive orders uh, and the effect that it has on the oil and gas industry in particular. And being the, the uh, House and Senate Minerals Business and Economic Development Committee, um, we just think it'd be a good idea for us to sit back, listen, uh, hear what some of the issues are, see what our executive branch is doing, uh, find out what's going on out there with the industry, um, and put our thinking caps on. We'll be back in two weeks. And uh, I know every one of us um, is elected back home. And our whole goal is, is to come and try to make our homes in the state of Wyoming better. And as we all know, the importance of the oil and gas industry in Wyoming is significant. I mean, we've got a long, long history of responsible development. And that responsible development's created jobs and created wealth uh, for our uh, communities. Uh, it trickles all the way down, uh, all the way down from our counties to, uh, to our school districts, to our neighbors. So with that, we've got, um, with the help of the Petroleum Association of Wyoming, we've got a couple of panelists today uh, that will give us a couple of overviews. One is how dealing with uh, executive orders, as I understand that, and what's going on out there with industry. Uh, and then we get a little bit of overview of sort of the impact uh, that we're seeing uh, with the environmental rules and regulations and executive orders. So just a little bit of an overview for the rest of the legislature that's joining us. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is going to be a good session, a good learning session for all of us. And so with that, I am very pleased and uh, very thankful to have the governor of the great state of Wyoming join us. And with that, Governor Gordon, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, and members of the committee. Uh, it's an honor to be with you today. And I will try to keep my remarks to the point in relatively brief, and, and uh, there are others that can answer uh, in, in more detail. But let me just begin with a, uh, just a, a brief kind of review of uh, our actions leading up, to these, uh, leading up to these orders, and then I'll get into more detail about what we're doing uh, presently. Uh, in the latter part of November, early part of December, we initiated a reach out to the administration and a conversation with, uh, uh, I guess, climate envoy now, um, John Kerry, uh, and had a serious conversation in which he expressed to us that this, could, this, uh, this administration was going to be willing to pursue all energy fronts. He particularly talked about small modular nuclear. He talked about carbon capture and sequestration. Uh, that conversation, uh, you can carry as you do, he did say he wasn't the domestic energy uh, person. Uh, we immediately initiated a, uh, uh, a study. You've seen that study. It was initiated on December 15th uh, when we, uh, sorry, it was completed on the, the December 15th, uh, which, which announced the economic effects of a federal drilling and leasing ban on eight Western states, including Wyoming. And those numbers are, uh, are, are palpable. Uh, on the 29th of uh, of, of January, um, I sent a letter to Kim Leibhauser, who is the acting director, state director. Uh, she is from your uh, old neighborhood, I think, uh, Chairman Greer. She is uh, from Washakie County, and she moved. She's moved down. We had a uh, uh, an, an extensive talk with her, really specifically around what are we going to do with sundries? What are we going to do with uh, the potential for development? And, and part of this was initiated from a conversation I had uh, with Governor Lujan Grisham in New Mexico, in which she was expressing many of the same concerns 
which is that nobody seemed to know uh, exactly uh, what they could uh, approve or what they couldn't approve. And they were also uh, sort of struggling with having to send almost every order up through the ranks to, uh, to DC and then wait for, for, for some sort of response. Uh, we are particularly concerned, obviously, with downhole and surface sundries, change of well location, change of surface hole location, and surface disturbances. Both Governor Grisham and I, in, uh, in, in a subsequent conversation, said that we need to begin to get the Western governors uh, together to uh, see if uh, we could compel the White House to reach out at least to Western states before uh, they, uh, they, they announce these actions that they, they have been contemplating. And, and I will note uh, that uh, Lujan Grisham is, is a Democrat and was one of the co-chairs of the Biden transition team. Uh, you, you'll also know that on the 29th, I issued an executive order to agencies to evaluate the impacts on operations and programs. And we'll be gathering those data uh, this coming week uh, and, and on offering guidance to agencies to determine the effect of both the 60-day pause and the open-ended ban. Over the course of, of January, uh, starting, I think, with Governor Lujan Grisham, uh, we, we initiated contacts throughout the, the Western governors. Uh, and it, to date, uh, I have had conversations uh, with Governor Dunleavy of Alaska, Governor Gianforte of Montana, Governor Cox of Utah, Governor Bergen. I was on the phone last night with Governor Bergen for about an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, I, as I said, Governor Lujan Grisham. Uh, I have had a couple of exchanges with Governor Polis, who's also concerned uh, about uh, the effects of this. Uh, Governor Little of Idaho, who is the vice chair of Western Governors, Governor Brown, the chair. Um, Governor Brown is from Oregon. Uh, Governor uh, Sununu, Governor of, of New Hampshire, Governor Holcomb, and Governor Ricketts, Governor Ducey, and, uh, uh, and, and Mike DeWine of, of, of Ohio. I think universally uh, there is concern that uh, the White House is not communicating or at least tracking exactly what uh, it, the consequences are to Western states. Uh, and, and so with that, uh, we are looking at a couple of, um, and a couple of approaches. Uh, one of them is a Western governor's approach that is being uh, spearheaded by this office uh, and, and is being uh, worked by Rob Krieger in my office. Uh, and, and they are working on a letter uh, Western Governors is a bipartisan organization, and, and so they are working on a way of trying to uh, bring this to light. Uh, with the Republican governors, uh, we are uh, looking at another letter, again, being spearheaded by this, this office uh, and, and looking at other strategies as well. I will say that uh, last Tuesday, I guess it was, uh, we had a Zoom conference uh, with the White House Director of Intergovernmental Affairs, uh, and Julie Rodriguez, and uh, David Hayes, the White House Climate Advisor and DOI Transition Team, uh, in which uh, actually Governor Lujan Grisham and I uh, pointed out that governors should be aware of what guidance is going to the Bureau of Land Management, that both of us were very concerned about what a moratorium would bring to our schools and to our uh, state's finances. Uh, Governor Lujan Grisham made the point, which I think is, uh, was nice to be made by a Democrat, that uh, a moratorium on federal lands was not going to do anything to, uh, to, to affect climate, that basically you would move production uh, offshore uh, play, to places where regulation was, was not as, uh, as, as great. Uh, and uh, we got out of that uh, an agreement for uh, periodic uh, join um, with, with uh, the two of us and, and them to sort of understand what their next moves were. Uh, 
and that we also got an agreement that we would get uh, some indication of what the guidance that was going to the Bureau of Land Management. Across the West, there is a great variety of, of how Bureau of Land Management offices and um, others are, um, and you'll hear this from Pete, I believe, uh, are how, how they're going about uh, actually issuing sundries, dealing with sundries, uh, if, and, and, and everything else. And our point was to uh, make sure that, that at least governors were aware of what uh, offices could or could not do, uh, the, the point being that we need to keep, we need to keep moving. Uh, and then I would say, uh, yes, uh, what was it? Yes, I, on the fourth, I guess it was, uh, we had a, uh, a serious uh, conversation with uh, Jennifer Granholm, who is uh, secretary designate of, for Department of Energy. Uh, I included uh, Holly uh, Krutka from the School of Energy Resources in that conversation. It was set up by Senator Lummis, uh, and we had a, a very forthright conversation about the importance of uh, domestic energy production uh, really right across the board from oil and gas uh, through coal, uh, through uh, uh, critical minerals and elements. Uh, and, um, you know, I'd love to say there was a commitment to continue funding. I can't really say that, but I can say that it was a very optimistic view uh, in which uh, Jennifer Granholm was talking about it's time we scale up climate solution issues, uh, which we talked about uh, how important Campbell County was in that mix. Uh, also, Lincoln County, it's a favorite of mine. Uh, the, the Kemmer uh, mines are, are, are beset, and I think there's really an opportunity there. We also talked about the value of having a partnership with the federal government in, in order to bring uh, more weight to that effort and perhaps engage uh, uh, Rocky Mountain Power in a more meaningful way, engage Microsoft in a more meaningful way, uh, and engage Occidental Petroleum in, in a more meaningful way. Uh, with regard to the open-ended ban of federal oil and gas leaving, uh, leasing, uh, you'll note that on the 26th, I expressed deep concerns about that ban and what that would mean to Wyoming. Um, we issued uh, support for uh, Senator Barrasso, Lummis, and Cheney bills requiring congressional approval for any such ban. February 2nd, uh, of course, you heard about the conference that we had. February 3rd, uh, we started our letters with the uh, with uh, Western governors uh, to President Biden. And, uh, and then on February 4th, we initiated our letter with the Republican governors to President Biden uh, and uh, we are uh, currently in the process of trying to set up a bipartisan working group of uh, Western uh, governors to work on issues like this band. And when I say Western governors, it's actually interesting because there are other governors uh, that, uh, that, that have expressed interest. As I said, Holcomb uh, from Indiana has some coal production um, and, and, and others. Um, so we'll continue to work on that. And then we are spearheading uh, a uh, Republican governor's working group on energy, or, yeah, Republican governor's uh, working group uh, on energy. I've also um, asked that we start considering all of our options. Obviously, this is sort of a uh, two-pronged approach. Uh, one, where we're talking about uh, how do we engage and steer the conversation uh, from this new administration so that we don't lose production and then we actually move forward? We've really pre uh, presented Wyoming as a leader in that field. Uh, you, you know that what we've done with the Integrated Test Center, you know what we've done uh, with, with uh, the, the various work uh, that we have re really led the nation from methane regulation to sage grouse to uh, migration corridors, and we've really touted the importance of those. So we're trying to engage on that front. But then we're also um, preparing a hammer if necessary. Uh, so I have asked uh, uh, the, the, the Attorney General to consider all options in that, in that regard. And so with regard to legal action, uh, the, it, it's important to remember the moratorium is not yet in place. 
Uh, so we'll need to wait to file our suit until the secretary or acting secretary acts. Once the secretary acts to implement the executive order, the state of Wyoming will file the challenge to that action and will ask the court to lift the moratorium immediately. Additionally, we have reached out to uh, traditional uh, partnering states uh, to coordinate and share ideas and strategies. You've heard a little bit of that so far. Um, we expect that other states adversely affected by this moratorium might join in, in, this, uh, in this litigation. Uh, and in addition to that, I guess I would point out that uh, we have uh, been in uh, constant communication with the Petroleum Association of Wyoming and have had calls with Williams, Devins, and, and others really about what this uh, leasing ban or moratorium uh, would mean uh, to operations in, in a number of states. And, and um, I think really right across the board, uh, states are looking at uh, similar, similar approaches. So with that, Mr. Chairman, um, obviously I think Randall Luthi is on. Uh, I think there may be others. We can answer questions if, if you have a few. I am happy to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, Governor, thank you for taking the time uh, to meet with us. We appreciate it. Um, we're going to respect your time and not uh, not ask you too many questions, but I do I do have one that's an overriding question. I think you know I see we've got um, you know over half the legislature is watching this morning. It's a very important issue to us, and I guess the, the one question I can ask is what what can we do to help? What do you need from us? Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you asked that question, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Co-Chairman. Uh, one thing that I think would be very helpful um, would be a resolution to the president and Congress um, really expressing concern about these issues and, and, and the fact that uh, they are really counterproductive. Um, and uh, then I think, uh, Mr. Chairman and the members of the legislature generally, uh, this could be a protracted uh, legal fight. Uh, and I think making sure that we have adequate funding uh, for litigation uh, is is of absolute importance. I will continue to bring you up to date on our on our process. I, I, we are working diligently to make sure that we're out ahead of this. And as I said, I can bring you up to speed on our work with other states and others to really oppose this very misguided approach to um, to energy development in the country. So, Governor, with respect to a litigation fund, what um, is that just? need to be placed with your office? Is that, or with the AG? Uh, what do you, what do you think in there? Now's the time to ask. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, I can assure you that um, it, it probably makes sense to, uh, uh, to keep it with us, um, but uh, we're happy to, to uh, we obviously work very closely with the, the Attorney General's office. Okay, well, thank you. Again, uh, very much appreciate you taking the time this morning, giving us an update. Again, reach out to any one of us. We're all here to help. We're all concerned about this particular issue. Uh, sounds to me like that, um, Senator Co-Chairman Anderson, you know, maybe we get um, a couple of our uh, new guys, Senator Cooper, he's gonna be one of the best senators in the state of Wyoming. I just have that feeling. Um, and then uh, we get uh, either Representative Bear or Representative Heiner maybe to work on that for us, huh? Sounds good. That'd be a good group. All right. That'd be awesome. Okay. Mr. Chair, uh, if I may just take a, a bit of privilege, I just want to note that uh, Senator Cooper was uh, mentioned. You have a, a uh, I guess, a, your, um, how would I put it? You are well known in Western states, I guess, uh, from New Mexico, elsewhere, from uh, Devon Energy and others. Uh, people have uh, commented, you have a great new senator. So Senator Cooper, uh, your notoriety is, is uh, well known. Thanks. All right. Governor. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Governor. We very much appreciate that. So Mr. Obermuller, are you, uh, are you ready, sir? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, All members right. of the committee. Thanks for your indulgence. A little technical difficulties going on this morning, but I think I've got, I'm recovered. Uh, appreciate that the committee is willing to do this in a work session. 
uh, it felt like uh, it was important to um, lay the facts on the table about what we know so far. And, uh, and it was very good to hear from, from Governor Gordon about uh, the state's plans, um, very much appreciated that. But also just get us thinking about other, um, if we can, other practical solutions uh, that we can, can collectively think about moving forward. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce a couple of, of, of guests for the committee, uh, if, you, if that's okay. Yeah, so Mr. Obermiller, that'd be awesome. Uh, just also uh, go ahead and introduce yourself and then committee members, uh, I think for the next uh, portion of this, please feel free to raise your hand if you have a question or something, we'll make this a little more interactive uh, for the rest of the uh, presentation. So, okay, go ahead, Mr. Obermiller, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I uh, don't usually need the reminder to introduce myself. Sorry about that. Pete Obermiller, <laughs> President of Petroleum Association of Wyoming. Uh, so one of the, one of the most enjoyable parts about this job, Mr. Chairman, is that I, actually there's uh, a several um, uh, law firms that operate in the oil and gas space that are members of the Petroleum Association uh, who have clients um, not only in Wyoming, but, but all over the United States that do oil and gas work. And uh, I have the privilege every year of, of working with almost all of them that are members in various capacities uh, and really very uh, accomplished uh, and smart attorneys who uh, handle all these issues for, for my members and for PAW on occasion. And so I'm um, uh, really grateful to have uh, two attorneys with Davis, Graham and Stubbs that uh, were willing to come today to talk to you all um, that are members of PAW. I'm just gonna introduce them briefly and I'll turn it over to them. Uh, first is uh, Katie Schroeder. Katie is a partner in the Natural Resources Department of Davis, Graham and Stubbs. Uh, her practice focuses on energy development on federal lands. Uh, she, her clients, uh, she counsels her clients on leasing and development on federal lands and uh, helps them navigate uh, National Environmental Policy Act, National Historic Preservation Act, Endangered Species Act, and uh, everything that goes along with all of those very complicated things. So um, uh, Ms. Schroeder is going to talk to you about uh, the Biden administration's orders related to the Department of Interior. And then, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Randy Dan, who's also a partner uh, but in the environmental group of Davis, Graham and Stubbs, his practice focuses on environmental litigation and enforcement, uh, permitting and regulatory compliance, site remediation. Uh, his, he counsels clients uh, uh, on uh, regulatory issues under uh, federal and state environmental laws, Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, RICRA, those sorts of things. And uh, he is a leader in the field of air quality and climate change regulation. So, Mr. Chairman, we've talked a, we've talked a lot about the DOI related orders. We haven't talked a lot about the orders related to EPA and WDEQ, and there were a, a number of those as well. So, it would be helpful for the committee uh, to hear a little bit more about that side of the orders from uh, from Mr. Dan. Uh, so, with that, Mr. Chairman, if it's okay with you, I'll turn it over to Ms. Schroeder for for her presentation. You bet. Go ahead. Thank you. All right, good morning. Thank you for the nice introduction, Pete. Thank you for the, or Mr. Obermuller. Um, thank you everyone for your time and having me here today. I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm gonna try and I have some slides, not too much, not too intensive, but just enough to kind of orient the discussion. So I'm gonna try and share those at the moment. Hopefully that's successful. We'll see. We, you know, Ms. Schroeder, we're we're very capable here with the Zoom stuff. We're we're all pros, and then uh, even go a step further. Anthony Sarah's there to help us, so we'll get it. All right. Excellent. Well, I um, I am not so capable with the Zoom, to be honest. Um, so I'm still getting the hang of it. All right. Here we go. All right. Can you did that work? Can you see my yes. screen? Yep. Excellent. Excellent. Well, as, a, as Mr. Obermuller explained, I'm here today to walk through the recent executive actions following the Biden, President Biden's inauguration. And my colleague, Mr. Dan, will walk through the sort of the environmental, the EPA side of things, but I'll focus on the Department of the Interior for today. And the three actions that I'm going to focus on are first, the secretarial order that, that was released the day of the inauguration. Second, um, Executive Order 14008, which came out about a week ago, 
And then finally, touch on regulatory actions that are under review by the department or may be under review by the department, because that's something they, um, that are, that those actions are going to be an important thing to keep an eye on. And I know that there's so much going on that it's difficult, or, you know, it can be difficult to keep track of things. And I, I mentioned this so that nothing falls through the cracks. So first we have Secretarial, Secretarial Order 3395. It was issued on Inauguration Day. And the effect of this order, and I, I want to emphasize effect, is uh, essentially a 60-day pause on all, quote, fossil fuel authorizations by the Department of the Interior. Now, I say effect because the order does not technically pause all fossil fuel authorizations. But what it does is it revokes the authority of the Bureau of Land Management, the Bureau of Offshore Energy Management, to make fossil, fossil fuel authorizations and instead requires that all of these authorizations go through um, one of the acting assistant secretaries. So it really route, it takes everything out of the, it takes all decision-making out of the state and field offices and routes them through headquarters. So Ms. Schroeder, right there, if I can ask you a quick question. So Please do. You know, we, we do have some federal APD, APAs, which are out there with, with our spacing units at, probably 95% of all the drilling units in Wyoming, but what about the sundry orders? Do they need, do they have to go that far up the chain or what, what are you seeing with those? So what I'm seeing is inconsistent implementation across field offices because the statement fossil fuel authorizations is incredibly broad and read literally, it could be anything that anything related to an oil and gas well that requires BLM approval. So if there is a sundry notice, then it could require, it, this order could be read to require that, that the state and field offices are not authorized to approve that. Same thing with, I mean, mundane, I consider fairly mundane and routine actions, unit agreements, communitization agreements, all of those kind of um, routine authorizations by the department, arguably there's this, this order could be read to remove authority for those routine authorizations. Now, as a practical matter, it's, and I say this based on anecdotes that I'm hearing from various operators, there's a lot of confusion as to how this order should be implemented amongst the state offices. So different states are handling it differently, different, you know, I understand, and again, this is secondhand, that different state offices are treating some of these authorizations as, you know, do they require, does it involve surface disturbance? Is this just a technical change? For example, if you want to change a bottom hole location, would that require, uh, um, you know, does the, does the department have authority to do that? But it's being handled differently. So there is inconsistency. And I think it's fair to say some confusion amongst the state and field offices as to how to implement this. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. One thing to put this in, I do want to put this order in context briefly. It's not unusual in my, you could tell we're eco-friendly here in Denver because my lights just went out because I've been sitting in my chair too long. So apologies um, for that it got dark all of a second. So all of a sudden, um, you can tell that, um, I want to put this in context because it's not unusual for incoming administrations to pause authorizations of major projects. You know, no no one, no administration wants to come in and then authorize something that no one knew about, right? You know, that's that's major, that's gonna cause headlines. It is unusual for an administration to implement a pause like this on these, what I would consider that I think a lot of people would consider relatively routine actions. And it's, and quite frankly, it's not clear to me what this, whether this order was intended to be so granular. And so particularly, you know, all fossil fuel authorizations, did someone, when, some, when, some, when this was written, did someone think about the possibility that it would affect sundry notices, for example? And so it is unusual to see this kind of very um, granular decision-making affected. And I tried to look for some historical precedent what I found was, I guess, um, when Secretary Tillerson took over the State Department or took, took the reins at the State Department, he issued a, a similar order that re re revoked the State Department's authority to make day-to-day -day decisions. And apparently that caused quite a kerfuffle. 
So it is, this is interesting because it's much more, um, like I said, granular and much more unusual than what you would see from a typical incoming administration. Schroeder, we do have a question. Representative Gray has a question for you. Oh, yes. You uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So just want to start out my question by just strongly denouncing these illegal unconstitutional actions by the administration. My question is, I mean, in your opinion, can they legally do this? I mean, it, it's just, if it's unprecedented, in your opinion, should we be challenging it and legally, can they, can they even do it? Yeah, go, go ahead, Katie. Yeah. Thank you. This is carefully written and I, a legal challenge would have to be carefully constructed. And I say that because I, what I that the distinction that I raised at the start of this is important because the order does not prohibit fossil fuel authorizations. What it says that they all, what it does say is that they all must be approved by headquarters, essentially. It has to go through an assistant secretary. So it's not a ban. And for that reason, it, a facial challenge to this order would be difficult. It, you would have to wait for someone to have a some sort of authorization denied or delayed in a way as a result of this order. And so this is finely crafted so that it doesn't prohibit these authorizations, but rather just changes who, who can approve them. The other thing to note is that some authorizations can be approved retroactively. So if you submit, for example, a suspension request, a communitization agreement, as long as those are timely filed, they can be approved later. So the devil is in the details in how to challenge this. Um, in my opinion, I'm, I'm more curious to see what happens at the end of 60 days, because I think it's unlikely this will continue it, it's such a blanket, you know, so at such a broad level. And, but I do think there will be subsequent guidance or subsequent orders or something to take its place. And that I think will be more telling. Okay, Representative Duncan has a question. Go ahead, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so my question is, you were <clears throat> backtrack a little bit. Um, you were talking about different states are implementing this differently or interpreting it differently. So does that mean that we can sort of do business as usual and just wait to see or um, because businesses, I mean, uh, states are doing their own interpretation. So I guess I need clarification. So are we kind of free to, to interpret it as we see and continue and versus big projects? Um, those are obvious, but, but the day-to-day -day business could, 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 sorry, haven't had enough coffee this morning, could continue. Go, go ahead, Katie. That's a great question. So no, business as usual cannot continue and those, that's not occurring. That, that's, that's a consistent theme among states. So no one can get an APD approved, for example. And just an example of that is that there were some APDs that were approved by various field offices the day the order came out, the day after the order came out. And those have since been um, acknowledged as void, that the BLM did not have authority to approve those APDs. So as a, pra and the same is true with the right of way, the, the, where there's confusion is down is on the very highly technical issues. Like I said, if you already have an approved APD and you need BLM's approval to change a downhole issue, can you get that approval? That's a little bit more unclear. So it's very much in the margins what where there's inconsistency as to the application of this. So Ms. Schroeder, hopefully uh, Pete gave you a heads up. We asked lots of questions. Representative Baird, <laughs> do you have a question? You put your hand down. Uh, my question was answered there when she mentioned that things, when Ms. Schroeder answered that things have been voided, so. Perfect. Representative Western. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I, I, I think Ms. Schroeder answered the question. I was that if I'm an, uh, if I'm an operator, I'm a drilling company, and I set my drilling rig up on fee surface, drill down into fee, then do a lateral movement and happen to go through federals, and I have to get that that spud permit from BLM, we're still unsure if that that's if that's a feasible thing or not. Correct. Unfortunately, 
that's called the typically called the fee fee fed situation where you're located on fee surface and you're drilling a lateral through federal minerals and you're penetrating multiple different mineral owners. If a fe- that requires a federal APD. And so this, this um, secretarial order would require that all decision-making related to that federal APD go through headquarters as well. And so that's one thing I did want to mention. You anticipated my, my next point, which is that this order applies anywhere a federal APD is required. So that would be um, federal surface, fee surface, fee fee fed, anytime there's a federal authorization, it doesn't, it, land ownership does not change. It really, the, the question is, is BLM approval required? And if the answer is yes, then it's affected by this order. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, okay, we'll let you get on to your next point. Thanks. <laughs> I think actually many of the points have been answered or many of the points have been addressed in the, by my answers to many of this, these questions. I guess I note that the Department of the Interior has since clarified that this order does not apply on tribal minerals. There are some exceptions that, to the order that give the, the state and field offices some flexibility to, um, to grant authorizations when there's a threat to human health, welfare, or safety, or where there may be adverse impacts to public land or resources. I have not heard of any state offices or field office taking advantage of these um, exceptions. So I haven't been, I haven't heard that they've been used so far. I was going to move on and discuss executive order 14008, but I'm happy to take any more questions. Uh, Representative Greg has a question, and then Representative Aaron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Schroeder, what, what is the, the statutory authority at the federal level for, for the executive branch to totally cease multiple use of, of public lands? I mean, I, I mean, to me, that's a principle that is not only part of our culture, it's, it's, it's all around statute. And what kind of authority does he even have to issue that sort of suspension? That's a great question. And the difficulty in challenging this order or even characterizing it as a ban on multiple uses is twofold. One, as I mentioned, it doesn't prohibit BLM from making this op- these authorizations. It just changes who makes it, who gets to make these authorizations. And as a practical matter that does impede routine operations, but technically there is no pro- prohibition on development. Two is just the, the short window. It's a two month, de- it's a two month delay. As I mentioned, it, this is unprecedented. We haven't seen this kind of delay applied to such routine authorizations, but it's not indefinite. And it, by contrast, well, you know, I'll talk more about the, the leasing pause, if you will, the leasing ban, that is indefinite. And so those are, that, the, 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 the duration of these orders is one of the, the distinguishing factors. Okay. We'll go to Representative Aaron and then, and then Senator Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Schroeder, you mentioned that uh, all these decisions are shifted up to headquarters. Have there been any actions that have granted authorizations or notices to proceed? Are those being issued or are they in a timely fashion or is everything just being held up? Go ahead. To my knowledge, nothing has been approved through headquarters. Now, again, I'm relying on anecdotal information. I understand that there has been discussion about sending some, you know, an operator or two sending a package up to DC or up to headquarters is not DC anymore, but up to headquarters. I don't know if that has occurred. And to my knowledge, there hasn't been any action, but in some ways, Mr. Obermuller might have more firsthand knowledge of that than me. Senator Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Schroeder, um, the last line of your slide there excludes private lands. I'm wondering if that doesn't open some windows for us uh, legally um, by excluding tribal lands, they've, they've made, in my opinion, they've opened a window to exclude other lands also. Um, and I understand it has to do with sovereignty, but, but, uh, there's, 
there's some discrimination of sorts there. Um, if we could approach it that way, is that something that, that could happen? Go, go ahead. The exclusion from tribal lands occurred because the secretarial order went out, like I said, the day of the inauguration. And quite frankly, it appeared very hasty and perhaps not completely vetted because there was a response from uh, the Ute tribe in Utah that, that said, hey, no one talked to us about this and you Department of the Interior have a trust and fiduciary responsibility to talk to, this, talk to us about this at a minimum and do what's in our best interest. And it was a very strongly worded letter. You may have seen it. And as a result, that, that letter prompted the department to exclude tribal lands. So as a result, it's with respect to this order, it's difficult to see how uh, uh, to see how much to read into the tribal lands exclusion because that exclusion really was a, a, a pretty direct reaction to um, an aggressive response by the tribe, and rightfully, I mean that the department did this without warning and they should have it should have talked to the tribe and you see a lot of discussion about tribal consultation and involvement coming out of uh, this administration and to have that or, that uh, order come out would have been um, a surprise so with respect in this situation I, I don't know if um, that's necessarily the case but going forward I think to that you know there is this thought that you know climate change impacts, don't vary by land ownership. And that's something the department should take into consideration as it makes these decisions. Uh, Representative Heiner, do you have a question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, as I've uh, experienced many of these BLM offices, regional offices uh, interpret these kind of orders differently and, and try to implement them in a different manner. Have we had any conversation with our acting BLM Wyoming State Director about how she sees this and, and any direction she will give to our regional offices? Katie or, or Mr. Obermiller, you may want to chime in there too. I don't, yeah, it may be better for Pete to answer that one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Heiner. Uh, yes, those conversations are, are, are ongoing and uh, I can talk a little bit more about that uh, you know, at the at the end of the uh, conversation with Ms. Schroeder and Mr. Dan. Thank you. Okay. All right, Ms. Schroeder, go ahead. All right. Let's see here. So the the second major action, and I'm sure everybody is well aware of this, is the Executive Order 14008. It was released just over a week ago. And it's both narrower and broader than the secretarial order. So one thing to note about the secretarial order that I should have mentioned earlier is it only applies to the Department of the Interior. So, but, but by contrast, the executive order applies to all federal agencies and it contains a, a mul multitude of directives. Um, Mr. Dan will touch on some of them. But with respect to federal lands, section 208 of the, on, of the order pauses, and that's the, the word used in the order, uh, new onshore and offshore federal leasing. So in this respect, the fact that it only applies to federal leasing, it's narrower than the secretarial order. It doesn't affect permitting or it doesn't directly affect permitting. And that was a talking point that was emphasized when this order was released is we are not stopping permitting. We're only re-examining leasing. And the point of this pause is to allow a comprehensive review and reconsideration of federal permitting and leasing. And particularly uh, the executive order directed the department to examine climate impacts and also the royalty rate of federal leases. And so I personally thought this order was quite interesting when you really parse the language, because I think there was a general expectation for two things. One is there would be a finite duration to this um, pause, you know, department, you go and you take a one year break from leasing and go study something. And that wasn't the case. This is an indefinite pause. And I think that's notable. And when I mentioned this order is broader than the secretarial order, that's why is the secretarial order only applies for 60 days. This pause is indefinite. The other thing that I think the public expected 
was it that the department would announce a programmatic environmental impact statement of the oil and gas leasing pro, um, program. And that didn't happen either. Um, that was something that I'm sure Wyoming's well aware was announced for um, coal leasing under President Obama's administration, but that didn't happen here. And so it was, a, it was much more general, the directive is to study climate impacts, study the federal leasing pro program, study the royalty rate. And so I personally thought that was interesting. Obviously there'll be more steps needed, more actions taken by the department to implement this directive. But it was, it, the order was surprising to me in that sense because it wasn't nearly as specific as um, I think I, I personally expected to see. In I, I, I heard Governor Gordon mention that, that Wyoming was waiting for BLM to implement or the Department of the Interior to implement the, this executive order. So far, many of the scheduled lease sales are still at least on the websites. They were there. The Wyoming sale was, was still advertised on the website last yesterday evening when I looked. I understand that BLM has canceled the, or postponed the Nevada sale, but I haven't seen other um, other state lease sales canceled yet. Uh, Representative Barry, you have a question, sir? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this actually may apply to the previous uh, executive order, but I was just curious if there's any legal action that can be taken based on the delays that are happening on uh, private land and private uh, uh, royalty rights when uh, they're delayed based on BLM uh, orders. Good, that is, I hate to be, I truly hate to be a lawyer, but that's, that will be a very fact intensive examination. It's, there are uh, claims or actions that, that result from delay, but the day, delay has to be fairly extraordinary. And it's difficult to compel the agency just based on the delay um, to, to take an action. And that's true of any federal agency. And so it would be it would be a highly fact intensive examination. So what kind of authorization are we talking about? How long is the delay? What was the justification given? It, it's more so they, they can be brought, but it's difficult to say categorically. Oh yes, go ahead. You know, if there's a delay, therefore it gives rise to a cause of action. It's a much more fact specific inquiry. And I think for that reason, that's one of the reasons we haven't seen. Um, uh, lawsuits filed challenging the secretarial order. It's, it's too soon and people are really waiting for it to be implemented. So Ms. Schroeder, I'm sorry, this is a good, a good point for this question. If one never hate being a lawyer, it's an honorable profession and uh, you should be very, very proud of that. Um, the, um, so a lot of questions we all get asked um, and, uh, and, it, and it really comes down to this, this deal with the spacing units and that, and in the BLM and just, I mean, 10 acres of federal minerals can hold the whole thing up is why can we not force pool uh, federal mineral interests or can we? Unfortunately you can't because, because of sovereign immunity. It, it, the United States can't be forced to do anything for, for sovereign immunity. It can't be forced to enter into a contractual agreement. It can't be sued unless it waives that authority. And so it has not waived the authority to be forced pooled. Yep. It's way too simple of an answer. <laughs> <laughs> there has yep. been, if I, if I may, there has been discussion over the years of how to handle these small pockets of federal minerals, particularly now that we've got long horizontal well bores and that these, these uh, you know, a little bit of federal in mineral interest can really delay owner uh, development of a whole spacing unit, for example. I think that is a question that should be considered, should be considered by lawmakers. It, it's related, but unrelated. It's related to this discussion because if BLM approvals are going to be harder to get, then there needs to be a pathway to develop those that mineral estate. But that's always been a plague. That's always been a challenge, even in when we didn't have these types of orders. So I say that because I think it's a worthy conversation for lawmakers to continue having and look and work with uh, the federal congressional delegation for solutions to that. 
So, you know, that, so that was kind of leads to sort of a thought. We get too much road time in Wyoming, right? So we get to think while we drive. And it's, you know, what with the downhole whole technology that we have, which is phenomenal, is, you know, we can avoid, you know, a 40 that sits in, in a, you know, what's now our standard spacing unit. Um, you know, could, could we redefine our spacing units and, um, and then let the government worry about the drainage issue? And quite frankly, that's a discussion for the, the Conservation Commission. Yeah. You know, they, they set those spacing units. You know, be, the, the question of whether there is a distinction between just draining the federal mineral estate and drilling through the federal mineral estate. So you can drain the federal, it's easier to drain the federal mineral estate. Um, I don't want to say it's easier. I'm, I'm choosing my words carefully here. But you need a, an APD to penetrate and produce the federal mineral estate. You just need a communitization to include the federal mineral estate in a spacing unit. And so those are different authorizations. They require different levels of review. So I mentioned that because it really the, 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 the biggest challenge is when operators are trying to drill these long uh, horizontals um, that penetrate the federal minerals and require an APD. That's the, the source of most difficulty. Okay, um, Senator Cooper. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Schroeder, you just said something that, that may be pretty pertinent here. You said penetrate and produce um, on a PP fed. What if we just penetrate? Uh, and skip that section of production. If it's a 40 in the middle and we've got a 1280, um, well, uh, we can give up a 40 acre section in the middle and produce on either side for, so that these operators and the landowners can can uh, reap the benefits of their minerals. Uh, or, or is it strictly penetration? Currently the BLM does not require an APD to produce, to penetrate federal minerals without production. And someone would have to be very careful and strategic in how they um, engineered that, because if you do penetrate and produce federal minerals, that's a mineral trespass, and that is not a situation anyone wants to find themselves in. But currently, if it, just, to, just to traverse the federal minerals with a well bore does not require a federal APD. There's no federal, there's no clear federal policy on this issue. So that, that, that could change in the future, but currently that's the state of the law. And that's, um, that's an approach that I've advised clients to work with BLM on. So, um, and then, so Representative Heiner has a question, but isn't that a lot that we can work with our oil and gas conservation commission on? Isn't that sort of falls into their purview on, on preserving uh, the uh, the overall mineral estate for the various owners, regardless of who it is? Is that where we should be looking for the most part? Yes, it's always a good idea to, to have an open line of communication with BLM when penetrating federal minerals. BLM wants to know that it's happening. It just doesn't require an APD to do it. But to your point, and just the, going back to the, the larger question of how do we configure our spacing units to protect all the mineral interests, that is a that I think that is best left to the uh, Conservation Commission. Yeah. Uh, Representative Miner had a question. Thank you, Mr. Co-Chair. Uh, I, I understand that this, uh, this pausing will, uh, will not affect those APDs that have already been issued, such that many of the, uh, our producers have up to two years of APDs stacked up already. But my concern is when you start drilling a well, there are many times things change and you need a sundry notice. And if uh, the, the office does not issue a sundry notice when you encounter uh, problems or something, you need to change your drilling plan. It could be a de facto halt to our drilling if, if those sundry notices will not come out in a timely fashion while the, the rig is out there drilling. So do you think the sundry notices could actually be slowed down or halted from our BLM offices? Yeah, go ahead, Katie. That's a good question. 
they shouldn't be. And particularly where you are, where there's active drilling occurring, it seems to me that that situation would fall within one of the exceptions to the order I mentioned, because where there's a, a, you know, a risk of damage to the mineral formation, for example, I mean, if you're out there, you've got a rig running, you're drilling, it seems that BLM has at the local level has the greatest flexibility there. But because of the fact that BLM is really reacting to this order somewhat you know, in real time, I think I would advise that Mr. Obermuller and other operators have a sit down with BLM to work through those situations so that everybody is on the same page if the situation arises. Okay. All right, we'll, we'll keep you going. We wanna make sure that Randy has a little bit of time. So we'll, we'll keep going. Thank you. Senator Cooper, did you have a question or just forget to put your hand down? Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Ms. Schroeder. Thank you. Thank you. Just a, I'll just recap here. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, two, the two orders are one's narrower and one's broad. They're both narrower and broader um, due to the due to the fact that the secretarial order applies to everything, but is only for 60 days. And just to give my Mr. Dan enough time to, to give his discussion, I do want to flag this list of agency actions for review. This list was released by the White House on Inauguration Day, um, and I just want to make sure everyone's paying attention to it. It released a, a list of actions that agencies, quote, will review. And so the agents, this is a directive to agencies to take a look at many of the administrative actions that were released over the course of President Trump's administration. It, this, or, this directive just requires review. So it doesn't actually direct the agencies to take any action with respect to any of the, the items listed on this list of actions. So it doesn't say you have to suspend these, you have to revise them, but many of these actions are the more controversial ones. So I think it's fair to assume that the agencies will take some sort of actions in response to this uh, directive to review, but the agencies do need to go through additional process to do so. And so the, as I mentioned, many of the more controversial items are on this list with respect to Wyoming and with respect to federal land development, I point out that they include the Council on Environmental Qualities, revisions to the National Environmental Policy Act regulations, uh, the 2019 uh, BLM revisions to the Greater Sage Grouse Resource Management Plans, um, several of the Fish and Wildlife Service rules implementing the Endangered Species Act related to critical habitat, for example. And then most relevant, um, or at least most timely, there was a directive to review the Migratory Bird Treaty Rule that was released in January and that never took effect. And yesterday I saw a news item that the Department of the Interior is pausing the effective date of that rule. I believe it was supposed to take effect on January, uh, February 8th. The department is pausing that effective date and, and seeking additional public comment. But I never saw, I just saw a news release. I never, I could not locate a formal, um, statement by the department to that effect. But that's just one example of um, kind of fallout from this uh, list of actions for review. And with that, that's, a, that's all of my prepared presentation. Um, I'll stop sharing my screen or I'll try and stop sharing my screen and um, uh, tr turn it over to Mr. Dan. Okay, well, Ms. Schroeder, we very much appreciate it. And you know, hang tight because we may have more questions that you may be able to chime in on as we as we uh, move forward. And and uh, we've got about an hour left, so uh, we're, we're in good shape on time. We appreciate it very much. So, Mr. Dan, um, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members of the committee, for having us this, this morning. Katie, uh, it says here you're still sharing the screen. Are you able to... And we can all verify that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is where my Zoom limits. Um, well, so this is where I yell off into the, you know, and just say, you know, Mr. Sarah, help. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It may be at the top of your screen. Is there an option to stop sharing? Well, I can stop video, but I think that just turns, yeah, I just go away. If, if uh, Mr. Sarah's here, this minute. I could do some of this, so. 
There we go. I don't. We get there. Is that your your uh, PowerPoint, Randy? No, uh, I no. think that's still my my. Oh. Let's see here. Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, I'm pushing a button. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the very top of the screen. There's, uh, I believe, usually a green bar. Yeah. And you should be able to unshare screen. Yeah, let me see. I have view options. Maybe do that. And or look at the very bottom. There you go. There we go. That work? Okay. Okay. Got it. Great. Thank you. If I push enough buttons, one of two things happens. What I want to have happen happens, or the whole thing locks up. So, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, apologize for that technical difficulty. I, I'm just going to spend a few minutes this morning providing you with a, a high level overview of what's been going on in the early weeks of the Biden administration as it relates to these executive orders that relate to the EPA slash environmental side of things and, and how those will impact oil and gas operations. I think it's fair to say that climate change is going to be the central focus of this administration. We've seen an executive order that states that climate is going to play a central role in the United States foreign policy and, and national security. And President Biden has created a number of new programs, departments, and positions that are, are climate related. Um, EPA is really going to be play a, a lead and central role in, in all of this. And, and of course, as, as one would expect, we, we can expect a number of climate related new regulatory requirements for oil and gas going forward. But what EPA is going to at least initially focus on and, and perhaps for, for the next four years is really unwinding as much as they can of the previous four years. Um, the pendulum is now swinging back in the other direction at EPA, similar to the way it swung in the other direction after President Trump took office and EPA really spent four years unwinding as much of as it could of the, the Obama EPA um, regulatory requirements. Um, and, and we'll see in the executive order that I'm going to discuss, that's really the central focus of, of what the president has directed federal agencies to do. Um, and, and, and of course, all of this, I, I think we can expect to see an intense focus on reduction of methane emissions from the oil and gas sector both at new and existing sources. And, and I'll explain why that's important in, in just a bit. So on inauguration day, January 20th, the president signed executive order 13990, protecting public health and the environment and restoring science to tackle the, the climate crisis. And this really made reduction of greenhouse gases a, a primary policy of this administration and you'll see that the, the second paragraph that I've highlighted, it directs all federal agencies to basically review all regu regulations that were promulgated during the, the Trump administration. So that's the, the broad unwinding, if you will, that I discussed earlier. Um, all agencies are directed to take a, a look at, at what was done under the Trump administration and make a determination whether those requirements should be rescinded, revised, suspended, et cetera. Now, I'll note that it, it, this can't just be done at, at the flick of a switch. They, they just can't go back and rescind these re regulations, at least those that were finalized a, a certain time ago. They're, if they did that, they'd be subject to legal challenge, challenges based on arbitrary and capricious action. They're going to have to go back, in my view, go back into the record and revise the record, if you will, to justify any changes they're going to make in terms of suspension or rescission or, or even um, withdrawing. In some cases of the executive order, it specifically calls out uh, specific regulations or, or amendments that were promulgated during the Trump administration and directs the agency, in this case EPA, to 
to specifically uh, propose a rulemaking by a certain time frame to make some changes, uh, a suspension, revision, or rescission of those regulatory requirements. And, and I'll spend just a, a minute talking about this, this highlight at the bottom, reducing methane emissions in the oil and gas sector. And I'll try not to get too far into the legal weeds, but this is, I think, maybe the most impactful um, part of this on the oil and gas in industry. So I just want to give you a little background as to what that is. Um, that in the wonky environmental world is referred to as Quad OA. Um, that's a national emission standard applicable to oil and gas facilities. That applies nationwide to federal lands, state lands, private lands, tribal lands. And these are basically emission standards that apply to oil and gas facilities, uh, i.e., uh, control of storage tank emissions, leak detection and repair requirements, well completion, green completion requirements. Um, this was a regulation that was promulgated under the Obama EPA in 2012. Uh, very significant regulation, again, applies nationwide. During the latter portions of the Obama administration, they started to move in a different direction on this. And, and I, I guess, let me just backtrack. These new source performance standards or national standards typically only apply to new facilities. They don't generally apply to existing facilities. Towards the latter portion of the Obama EPA, they started to, to move in that direction to, to develop standards for existing facilities. And this is a, this is a big, uh, it's impactful because it's, I think operators would tell you it's one thing to design and build a facility with, with new requirements in mind. It's something else to have to go and retrofit existing facilities to comply with new regulations. I think it's generally more costly and, and generally not, not as economic. Um, so the Obama administration was moving in that direction. The Trump EPA stopped that effort. Um, and made some changes uh, to the regulation that that to, there's a legal argument that prevents um, EPA from going in that direction, at least initially. Um, and what the order has done here is, is that they're specifically directing EPA to propose new regulations, methane regulations for existing operations in the oil and gas sector. So I, I don't think this is a surprise to the oil and gas industry, but um, the executive order specifically mandates to EPA to develop these new regulations by September 2021, which is a bit, that's a pretty tight time frame, in my opinion. I think there's some, some unwinding, I think they still need to do, of certain um, Trump EPA amendments, but this is what uh, the executive order is directing to, to EPA. And again, this this will have I, I, a significant impact on oil and gas operations because again, asking companies to retrofit existing facilities is a bit different than asking them to build new facilities with new requirements in, in mind. So I think this is maybe what's front and center for a lot of folks right now and, and where this is headed. Um, but it, it looks like there's a pretty tight time, uh, deadline for EPA to, to get that done. Mr. Dan, if I can, uh, Representative Gray has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dan, I have two questions. One is, uh, got a couple emails, folks hoping to get a copy of the slides if possible, um, Ms. Mr. Dan and Ms. Schroeder. And then the other one is, uh, uh, how can, you know, it's based on the question earlier to Ms. Schroeder. I mean, how can they, they, they basically undo the principle of multiple use, which are statutes, the federal statutes that they're all over with this inaccurate finding in an executive order as the, the premise for it? You know, I, I think this executive order, they're really just directing, this order is directing EPA to take a look at existing regulations, which, which is certainly within their authority to do so. And again, the, the Trump EPA did the, the, the same exact thing throughout its four years. Um, I, I, so the authority to kind of review these regulations, I, I think, exists. Now, whether they can make changes to those regulations is really going to depend on, on how they go about that. And I, and I assume they're having many discussions right now and determining strategy on what that looks like. But, but as I mentioned, they need to, 
develop a record that's going to support a regulatory change. It can't just be pure political reasons. It, there has to be some evidence, science in the record demonstrating why the, the revision or, or, or uh, revi uh, rescission is, is appropriate. And, and I'll be happy to share these slides. Yeah, what we'll probably do is um, we'll, we'll get those Mr. Obermuller and we'll, we'll send those to LSO and then uh, we can ask the members who want that to go ahead and, and ask for them. So that'll, that'll work fine. We, we put them with our minerals materials too. So. Okay, I'll, I'll just move on to one more slide here from the executive order that I think is, is important. Um, the Biden administration is, is refocusing or redirecting federal agencies to look at what's called the social cost of, of carbon. And, and this is uh, basically a methodology to monetize damages associated with, with climate change. Um, increased wildfires, increased flooding impacts to agriculture. Um, and, and really the this, this was developed under the, under the Obama administration and, and fell out of favor, obviously, with the Trump administration. And, and President Biden is refocusing the agencies on this and, and why it's important, because as you would imagine, monetizing those, those impacts that I just mentioned could, could be a very large amount. And it allows agencies, when developing new rules in the rulemaking process, they have to do a cost-benefit analysis. And on the benefit side, any even small reduction in methane or, or climate or, or greenhouse gases is going to look like a very big benefit when, you, when you're considering these, these large dollar amounts for these, these impacts. So when you're, when you're weighing the cost benefit uh, of a new regulation, it's gonna be very hard to, for the cost to ever outweigh the benefits. So in short, what this means is almost no, no new, new regulation will be too costly when you're considering the benefits um, that will be viewed in terms of climate and um, reduction of climate impacts. Uh, so I, I just wanted to point this out as a, a another um, important provision of the executive order. And then- Randy, I, yeah, yeah. I, this may be a little glib, but I just, what, what, so I understand greenhouse gases, but what do they mean by carbon? Because as I look around my office, everything has carbon in it. What, what is meant by that term carbon? I, I think it, it's greenhouse gas. It, it's CO2. Okay. It's methane. CO2? You, you, right. Okay. Right. Now, I, and, and for the record, sugar beets love CO2, okay? <laughs> they need it to throw. All right. Uh, uh, yes. Um, so that's it for the executive order. I, I guess the last statement I'll just make in terms of uh, this this new EPA administration I mentioned earlier, it's it's obviously going to have an intense focus on on reduction of oil and gas methane emissions. That's going to be a big um, focus of this EPA, both in terms of rulemaking, but I, I'll also note in enforcement. I think it's fair of, to to say that we can expect increased enforcement from EPA as it relates to oil and gas facilities um, nationwide. We've, we've already seen evidence of that in certain jurisdictions. Even in the latter days of the Trump administration, we've seen um, fairly significant enforcement actions go out against the oil and gas industry related to, to emissions. Um, and I, I, I expect that trend to continue over the, the next four years. And with that, uh, I'll take any more questions and just say thank you. Okay. Uh, members, any questions? Okay. Well, that's, uh, that's pretty. Uh, Representative Gray. Hey, there. And then Co-Chair Anderson. So, Representative Gray. phone was ringing a minute ago. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank, thank you. I'll go last. I, there's a couple others that have raised their hands, and I've talked a lot, so I'll go last. Okay. They yeah, are right, great. Chairman Anderson and then Senator Cooper. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, is uh, the methane control they're talking about, does that include flaring or is flaring uh, a way to get rid of methane that they'd like to, like to have happen? You know, I, I think in any EPA rule, there won't be any sort of um, limitation or reduction on the amount you can flare. I, I think that's more within interiors, potentially jurisdiction. Um, 
In terms of flaring, there would be requirements on the types of flares you need to use to control, for example, storage tank emissions. Um, and there would be emission limits that, that limit the amount um, of, of NOx emissions that, that result from these flares. Um, so the, the main flaring provisions that we would see from an EPA regulation would really be the types of flares, their destruction efficiency, et cetera, that you need to employ to, to control emissions from, from, for example, storage tanks. Okay, Senator Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one thing I took away from what Mr. Dan had to say here that really caught my, brought my red flags up, if you will, if, when he's talking about existing facilities, um, that's probably the, as dangerous or, or more dangerous part of this action as anything else in here. Uh, you know, we make our money off of production, not off of drilling. And our old legacy productions are old, but there's still a lot of oil coming out of the ground. Uh, but a lot of those wells are very marginal. Uh, if we have to go spend $100,000 to uh, upgrade a facility, it's probably, it probably dooms as well. So this little piece of, of this is, uh, is something as we move forward that we really need to pay special and close attention to, if you will. Uh, spoken like a true Washkie County guy, Senator Cooper. <laughs> so, Mr. Dan, do you have any comments on Senator Cooper? I, I think that's an excellent point. Um, and it's, it's not uncommon for new regulatory burdens on existing facilities to cause folks to just plug these wells because the, the regulatory costs are just too, too, too extreme, if you will, to continue operating that, that, that facility. Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Dan, and also Ms. Schroeder. You know, one of the things that I'm hoping to, maybe you can help us with is, I've been working on this on our coal-fired power plants, constructing the strategy that would allow us to not implement these at the state level and to not allow them to be implemented, the most effective strategy possible that gives us the best chance of success. So, I mean, could you go through that if you were a legislator and, and you know, please, I, I don't want to do just talk about resolutions. I mean, resolutions, that's fine. We can pass a resolution, but, you know, I want to have a T to green strategy that is constructed the, the, the most intelligently to, to make, to say, we're not going to implement these in the state of Wyoming. These are not going to be implemented. So what would be your suggestion on a T to green strategy? And I know the rule hasn't totally gone into, these are just executive orders and kind of initial things, but assuming they go the full length and indefinitely suspend um, oil and gas leasing or you know, whatever the, the end, you know, go the full extent of the, of the mile that we think we're, that they might go, what, how do we construct the best strategy as a committee possible to challenge that from T to green? Any, anybody wants to? We're all interested in that. <laughs> into the what can we do? Maybe I'll just respond. And Katie, I'm sure you have some thoughts too. I, I, uh, that's a great question. And, and unfortunately, I, I'm not sure I have any grand strategy right now to, to communicate to, to the committee. But I'll just say this on the environmental side, or at least on the air side, under the Clean Air Act, the way it's, it's built, EPA essentially has ultimate authority. Um, over states um, and, and what needs to be implemented at the state level. And, and so I, I'll just say it would be difficult for a state to not implement any sort of federal standards that EPA uh, adopts pursuant to this administration. It's just the way the, the Clean Air Act is structured that EPA essentially has ultimate um, authority. And, and for example, even state regs that are developed via the Clean Air Act and put into what's called the state Impl implementation plan, EPA can unilaterally and on their own enforce those state regulations against folks, whether the state is on board or, or, or not. So it, it's, it's difficult, at, at least under the Clean Air Act, um, to come up with any sort of strategy that, that, that you're, you're referring to. Katie? With your, on federal lands and going to your question about any kind of long-term leasing ban, I look at two 
categories of actions, one that are unilateral by the department and the or the executive branch. So all of these executive orders, secretarial orders are these unilateral actions where the department just announces them and they, they take effect. The other category of actions is anything that goes through a formal rulemaking. And obviously anyone has the opportunity to go to participate in a rulemaking action. You know, those require public notice and comment. And I encourage anyone who may be affected to, to write letters and provide concrete specific data to the actor, um, to, the, to the agency it, to justify their position. And so I say that because if, you know, often I look at comments, I look at administrative records and it's sort of a popularity contest. Well, I like this, it would be helpful. Or I don't like this, this would be bad. But that doesn't really give the agency much to go on. And so particularly for those um, involved in government, you have such access to information that I would say, well, okay, let, let's use, for example, the data in the study that Wyoming published. What are going to be the impacts of long-term curbs uh, or you know, decreases on the amount of leasing? Co pr provide that data, provide quantified information, provide information about tax bases, about employment, all that type of nuts and bolts information um, is, is useful to an agency, but also sets up the best defense or puts you in the best litigation strategy down the road, because now there's concrete information that the agency arguably disregarded when it made its decision. Unfortunately, there's not that kind of participation opportunities for unilateral action. And so when you do have a unilateral action that adversely affects, for example, the state, the best recourse is to involve the attorney general's office and, and file, a, file litigation, challenge it in court. Um, because there is no opportunity for public engagement at that point. And I believe I, I heard Governor Gordon say that the Wyoming, Wyoming Attorney General's Office is evaluating a challenge to um, the executive order and the, the leasing pause. And that's a great example of that is the most immediate recourse um, for an adversely affected state or individual in that situation. So Members, uh, one of the things we can do, and Mr. Obermiller, maybe we'll lean on you a little bit, but when you see notices for comments, you know, if you would forward those to Chairman Anderson and myself, we'll get those out to the committee members. I, I do know the benefit uh, in a different area of, um, of those public comments, and, and they do get considered. And, um, and I get asked to write quite a few letters, and I always make sure to change it from a form letter to my own language and, and, and put my own spin on it. And that is important. So I think we can, um, it, as a minerals committee, can make sure we take the extra time to make those comments. So it's just, without looking every day, we don't know when those notices come up. So little assistance would be good. I've got, uh, and I, I apologize, because Senator Biden wasn't on my screen. And now that we're not screen sharing, I see he has his hand up. So I don't, Senator Biden, did you have a question? I do, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, Katie and Randy. Thank you for your presentation today. Uh, question's kind of out of left field, but it, it's just been burning, so I need to ask it. Uh, what would prevent? What would happen if companies just ignore these executive orders and continued on with their operations? Um, if enough companies had the "catch me if you can" attitude. What could the feds possibly do to stop them? And what would be the repercussions of that? Thank you. So, some dangerous legal advice coming now. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that's important just to, to as a baseline is that the these orders only apply to federal agencies. So they limit the ability of a federal agency, for example, to issue a permit, or when I say a federal agency, the BLM, they limit the ability of the BLM to issue a permit or issue a lease, but they do not constrain directly any oil and gas operator. So it's not the same as, you know, someone drew a line and said, don't cross it. It is the, the, the restraint is on the BLM to on what it can approve. So 
I don't think it would be advisable for companies to go out and start drilling on lands where they don't have an APD or a lease that would cause all kinds of trouble. But I think, and so I say that because it is important to recognize that the limitation is really on the federal agency and that the, 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 the impact on the public, even though they're very acute, and when I say the public, I mean operators, they're acute impacts, but they're at some level indirect because it's limiting the access to a permit or a lease, but not actually a prohibition on the company. Okay. Just say I've got yeah. Representative Sherwood. Senator Cooper, did you have your hand back up or just forget to? Okay, we'll go uh, Representative Sherwood, then Senator Cooper, then Representative Burkhardt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In regards to the cost to retrofit existing facilities, I'm wondering if this, um, we have seen examples of how this can be done in a way that creates a win-win situation, that our producers would get to continue production while reducing emissions. Um, so things like a low interest revolving loan account or matching grants, or do we anticipate federal assistance with retrofitting these facilities to assist with this transition? Yeah, that, that's a great question and great point. And I guess I'll say this, I, I think there are examples and I'll use Colorado as, as one, probably the most um, aggressive state in terms of new regulations for oil and gas facilities existing. Um, you know, I, I think there's a way to do it to, to set certain thresholds of applicability of, 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 of which facilities that these rules apply to that can balance these, the, the economic interests with the, the interests of reducing emissions. And, and as Katie alluded to before, I, I think that makes it even more important for Wyoming to participate in these rulemaking processes that are, uh, are going to get underway this year. It's going to be transparent notice and comment rulemaking that the state will have an opportunity to, to participate in and make EPA aware of the, the local impacts to operators within the state and some of these burdens um, that would occur from regulating existing facilities. I, I, I think I, th there's a balance here and, and I think mo it mainly lies in terms of being careful in which existing facilities that these apply to. It's not necessarily going to be all. Um, there's, where we draw that line will be important. But I think maybe Pete, when you get a chance, uh, we'll go through these questions and get to you, but Pete's prior life, he represented our counties. And when we went through that round of our resource management plans, that was one of the things we were looking at was doing uh, the, the studies regarding the economic, social and economic impacts of these uh, agency actions. And again, we're gonna have to be more active and we're gonna have to have that information behind us and that's uh, gonna have to go down to the local level. And so as we, we as legislators, we're gonna have to pick that back up again and look at it. We haven't for the, that much for the last four years, but we're gonna be back in that mode again. So Pete, if you just kind of bookmark that in your mind, cause I know you know that area very well. So Senator Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Two short questions for uh, Ms. Schroeder. Um, on the uh, executive order, uh, you very specifically said it's not a ban on permitting, it's a ban on leasing. Um, with that said, should we be telling our operators to move forward with their permitting process so that uh, when the 60 day window, if it goes away, uh, they have their permits in hand? And also a question on tribal lands, is that, uh, does that include just tribal operators such as the Southern Ute? They do a wonderful job down there, but uh, in other areas, such as Wyoming, we don't have a, a strong tribal operator um, arrangement, and we have um, non-tribal operators on tribal lands. So does that uh, exclusion include non-tribal operators? Thank you. Katie, you're on mute. Thank you. Yep. Um, to answer your first question, yes, I've been telling operators, go ahead and continue to submit um, APDs. And that's because I've been told that BLM is continuing to process um, applications, process everything in the normal course of business. If I was in BLM shoes, I would not want to find myself 60 days behind if the, once the secretarial order expires and there's no subsequent guidance on limiting permitting. So I have been telling operators to continue to submit permits. 
also lease extensions, uh, at least suspensions if those are necessary, communitization agreements to just keep on, keep on sending BLM whatever you would normally send so that you're not, so that you, you minimize your delay. Now, again, we don't know what's coming at the end of 60 days, but so far all signs are there will not be a ban on permitting. To the second question, that's a great question about what it means to, to say that tribal lands are excluded. Um, the exclusion applies to non-tribal operators operating on tribal minerals, Alati minerals. So any basically a, a tribal lease and Alati lease, an Indian Mineral Development Act lease, any of the, that category of tribal leases are excluded from these directives. Um, so they would, it doesn't, the, the status of the operator does not matter. Okay. Representative Burkhardt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, a question for Ms. Schroeder or Mr. Dan. How do those orders ultimately impact Wyoming DEQ in that Wyoming DEQ um, manages the EPA rules somewhat in, in Wyoming? I'll let Mr. Dan take that because the, the interior orders really, they don't directly affect EPA or excuse me, DEQ. So, so we're talking basically air quality, right? They're promising. Yes. It, and, and similarly, the, at least initially, the executive orders don't impact Wyoming. They basically direct EPA to go back and look at these, these regulations and, and possibly make changes. So ultimately, if, if EPA goes through that process and, and develops new air quality slash climate regulatory requirements or makes some amendments to existing, uh, that impacts Wyoming to, to, to some extent because uh, states can implement these, these national standards and some states do. Um, so they, they, they wouldn't be required to, but it would be an option for, for the state to do that. Otherwise, these, these national standards that I've been discussing are really independent and stand alone and are enforced by EPA. So, so they wouldn't necessarily impose any additional burdens on Wyoming DEQ, unless again, the state chooses to um, adopt and implement these national standards. Follow up, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, who, who was that? Follow up? Follow yeah. up, please. Yeah. So the follow up on that, Mr. Dan, if Wyoming chose not to implement, then the feds would just come in and do it themselves. Am I correct in that? Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Well, folks, I'm going to, um, just so that uh, we can get to our last day, I'm going to ask Mr. Obermuller, uh, Pete, if you've got a few, few comments, a few things to bring us home, you know, like I say, our number one question is how can we help? What can we do? Appreciate it, Mr. Chairman. I, I just have four quick slides. So what I want to do is just give uh, the committee a, a sense about what we're, uh, what we're talking about here, just get down to it to the Wyoming level. Uh, and then, uh, uh, and then leave us with maybe a little bit of uh, uh, some positive thoughts, perhaps, um, as we as we move forward. So, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, Mr. Chairman. Okay. And uh, work these through these real quick. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to to show the committee this one, this map in particular. This map um, might take a little minute to orient yourself. It's it's obviously topographic of, of Wyoming and. Um, uh, it shows, this map is showing all of the current leases in Wyoming. Um, I should have put the total on there, but but you can see there on the right how it's labeled. Um, there is all, all the blue areas on this map are leases in Wyoming that are held by production. Um, when you when you get a lease and when you first first spud and it starts to produce, that 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 attaches to it requirements from the federal government to to produce that lease uh, continually. Uh, then all of the, uh, that's what the blue areas are, Mr. Chairman, uh, both for oil and gas. Uh, moving over to the purple ones, the purple are non-producing leases. These are leases that have been acquired by uh, companies, but don't have production on them as yet for various reasons. Uh, and, and those reasons are important because uh, I wanted to give the committee just a, a, an overview about the areas we're talking about, but also all of the rhetoric out there about, well, it's not a big deal. We have all these leases. 
um, it's business as usual, that sort of thing. Uh, and, and that's fine. I, I, I don't, uh, you know, we could, reasonable could, people can debate on that. But as it relates to Wyoming, when you look at um, those numbers, by the way, are the number of leases that, that are held in Wyoming, either held by production or, or non-producing. When you're looking at the, the purple leases non-producing, they're non-producing for a lot of different reasons. Um, number one, it takes time. So the vast, vast majority of the purple non-producing leases are, are leases that were acquired in the last three years. Uh, and then also they are, um, there is a significant chunk of them that have been, um, that are where development is not allowed as a result of litigation. So leases, uh, they, they cannot move, uh, production cannot move forward on those uh, while they're tied up in the courts. And then, you know, just on a more business level, Mr. Chairman, particularly when you're looking at these purple ones on the perimeters of the Powder River Basin, both over here in, in Weston and Niobrara counties and over here on the western side of, of Johnson County and those, these are all very, um, these are exploratory. We, we don't really, we don't know what, what, what access is there and, and, and what possibilities are there. So they take time. So the question on the, on the leasing ban is an important one uh, for the long-term health of, of the industry in Wyoming and also for the long-term revenue uh, projections for Wyoming. Uh, it is not necessarily the immediate crisis. Uh, so it is true, you can see, there's quite a bit of area here that has leases that, that could be available for production. The leasing ban like this in terms of industry has a more disproportionate impact on smaller and mid-size operators. Um, of which about 80 percent and uh, uh, about 80 percent of the operators in Wyoming are small and mid-size. Uh, they just don't have uh, the, the capacity to um, uh, to have a multi-year process of gathering leases and building core areas like some of our larger producers might. Uh, so uh, you will see that it will impact if it's indefinite and there's and there's not um, movement on that, you will see that the smaller and mid-sized operators have a, have a much difficult, more difficult challenge. Uh, larger ones might be able to, to, to last for a little bit longer under that. Uh, but that also really relates to uh, the, the next topic, which is the permit, uh, the permit side of it. As it relates to revenue to Wyoming, uh, it was already alluded to before, and I think you all know that particularly in these, uh, for oil production in these long laterals, the, the, the biggest production is it within the first few, frankly, the first few weeks and months, definitely in the first year. So to the extent that a leasing moratorium prevents the, um, the pipeline, as it were, no pun intended, of, of new production, you'll see a declining revenue curve for the state of Wyoming too. And that's the point. What was, what was interesting about the University of Wyoming's study was that they bifurcated whether, whether there was a permit ban or a leasing ban. And they quantified the loss of revenue to the state of Wyoming under a leasing ban precisely for that reason, because leasing has its own revenue attached to it. All of those purple areas have, have leasing um, uh, payments that are, are shared with Wyoming. Uh, and then also the fact that no, there's not new development uh, after that in the pipeline, then, then the production is, uh, is reduced. So moving on to the permit ban uh, uh, quickly, uh, I'm very interested to hear Ms. Schroeder talk about her impression that, that we'll see something different at the end of 60 days. I hope that's true. I, I have that sense. And part of it is because this, I, this whole notion of business as usual. I, I actually take some of the Biden administration's um, uh, spokespeople at their word that they expected it to be business as usual, uh, but did not uh, anticipate uh, the number of actions that happen after the initial permit. Uh, and I think that might be a, a confusing point to some is that a permit is not a one-time action. Uh, there are, uh, especially in these larger operations, it's a continual dialogue between the operator and the regulators at the BLM. And it requires repeated actions to make sure that, that both sides know what's happening and that approvals go forward. So that includes technical things like, like Ms. Schroeder was talking about on downhole locations, but also wildlife issues, um, safety issues, uh, other environmental issues, it's continual. And to the extent that Wyoming's field operators feel like that their authority have been taken away from them to make those decisions, then it's not business as usual. And uh, I suspect that, that national BLM is sort of learning that now. And, uh, and uh, to the extent that after 60 days, we can move that in a better direction, uh, then it does, in fact, uh, by a little bit 
of time, but not an enormous amount of time. So with, with that in mind, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to, um, and I, I can make this available to you all. All of this data is public data. Um, uh, each one of these leases has an operator attached to it, all that, it's all public. So I'm not, it's not, I'm not sharing anything uh, out of the ordinary here, but. Um, so Mr. Chair, moving on just real quick to some solutions. It was, it was alluded to already about the possibility of working with the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission uh, on spacing units and those sorts of things. I, I do think it behooves us all to think very critically about how can we maximize the potential of, of recovering Wyoming's resources that are not attached to the federal estate? Uh, you know, operators are, of course, going to evaluate the risks of where they're going to produce. And if the risk at federal, in the federal estate is too great, they're going to go elsewhere. And to the extent that we can provide that, uh, that elsewhere in Wyoming, uh, that, would be, that would be good for the state, good for Wyoming's operators. Uh, otherwise, they'll be forced to look elsewhere. But to that point, Mr. Chairman, I think we have, uh, and I'll move to natural gas in a second because there's, there's work there too, but I do wanna leave the committee with, the, with a couple of thoughts here. This is the most recent data from the Energy Information uh, Administration regarding uh, projections for US crude oil production all the way out to 2050. I won't bore you with all the details of the various lines. The black line in the middle uh, is, is simply their reference case. Uh, the most this, this is not the most pessimistic scenario, obviously, these, these are, but, uh, but essentially the, even the most pessimistic scenarios, um, other than low oil and gas supply and low oil price, uh, which I don't think given demand we're going to see, uh, that we basically continue to increase production in, in the United States all the way until 2030 and then it plateaus according to the EIA. Some other uh, analysts have it have it peaking in 2030 and going down. Those are more more pessimistic, uh, but essentially we we are in the position of global demand continuing to rise for oil. Uh, couple that with the fact that Wyoming's uh, product, particularly in the Powder River Basin, is desirable, and we have opportunities here if we can collectively um, uh, you know make sure that we can maximize it. Shifting to natural gas, this one is critical for us too. You can see that it's even that the projections are even uh, more rosy with respect to natural gas in terms of, of production uh, out to 2050. It continues to climb. Uh, uh, why? Uh, because this is, of course, uh, uh, you know, if to the extent that we are in an energy transition, um, uh, we can talk about that at a different time. But uh, to the extent that we are, natural gas is going to play a very, very big role uh, in that moving forward. And Wyoming has an enormous natural gas resource and an important natural gas resource in the sense that, uh, that the gas fields in Western Wyoming are, are primarily gas fields, it's not associated gas. And that, that, that is a competitive advantage for us um, that helps to offset our distance to market. And um, there are some opportunities there for us uh, to, uh, to maximize Wyoming's natural gas product uh, and to elevate it and, and offer it at a, at a premium. That's going to take some work on the part of, of, of Wyoming and a part of our operators. I added one quick slide during the discussion once we went to methane because I wanted the committee to see this. This, this relates to Wyoming's natural gas uh, competitive advantage. This is the EPA's data, most recent data on, on methane sources of emissions. Uh, so I'll, I'll let the ranchers and the committee discuss what enteric fermentation is. That is the top uh, emitter of methane uh, in, uh, in the United States. The second is natural gas systems, and, and uh, that is true. It's important to note that uh, I didn't put it on here because I didn't want to add additional words, but the, um, the natural gas systems methane emissions since 1990 has declined by almost 24%. It continues to decline. And that is as a result of, uh, in contrast to enteric fermentation, which has actually increased by uh, almost 9% over that same time period. The, the natural gas systems is, is uh, that decline over time can be attributed to innovation and to the, the, uh, the ability to, to capture more, prevent leaks, uh, and, uh, et cetera, over time. That's, it's, it's, uh, the, the numbers don't lie about that. And we're going to have to redouble our efforts on, on the methane emissions uh, in order to, to add a premium to Wyoming's natural gas. We have, we have some competitive advantages there. And Western Wyoming operators have already taken some pretty dramatic steps on this. 
but there is markets to the west of us. Um, and and uh, if we can uh, get West Coast ports, um, uh, export uh, facilities, uh, which you know at this point is looking more likely to happen in Mexico or Canada, the United States, but but to the extent to the extent that that happens, and we are able to reduce uh, methane emissions from Wyoming gas uh, even further, um, then and you know through innovation, which, which industry is already working on. Um, I'm not 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 talking about um, I'm talking about regulation here. Just 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 innovation, which is always more successful at the end of the day. We, we have opportunities, and and we have tools in Wyoming to help there, including through the Wyoming Energy Authority, uh, and through uh, our uh, you know um, experts over at the School of Energy Resources that can really bring us uh, can help bring us to uh, to a competitive advantage in our natural gas uh, industry. Mr. Chairman, that's uh, all I wanted to leave you with was uh, that um, it's going to be challenging times for us. It's going to be challenging time for you, as you'll discover in, in when you start talking about your budget um, in the first week in March. Um, let's not sugarcoat that. Uh, but we have opportunities, and if we can, um, through our various you know advocacy, legal efforts, uh, and innovation by uh, by industry, uh, uh, we uh, we have opportunities, and we can maximize them. Yep. Let's see, I have a, a question from uh, Senator Biden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Pete. Boy, I do not envy you, buddy. You've got a, you are in for the fight of your life, my friend. Um, with that said, um, what's the plan? What's the plan to fight back? Um, please don't tell me you're going to follow Cole's uh, game plan because that didn't really work out for them. Um, this is an existential threat to oil and gas in Wyoming the next four to eight years and possibly beyond, depending on how these elections shape up in the next presidential. Um, this is it, this is for all the marbles. Um, how, how are you guys gonna do this? Because this is a huge deal. And um, my job and many others jobs depend on, on this. And, and uh, what's PAW's plan of attack? Are you guys gonna be aggressive in fighting or are you gonna go, kind of go along to get along? And like Cole did, so. Good luck, my friend. Thank you for all you do. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, appreciate it. And thank you, Senator Byman. Good to see you, by the way. I'm glad you're feeling better. Um, yeah, I, I imagine my friend and colleague, Mr. Detai, would um, would say that they didn't go along to get along. But, uh, you know, to, you, your, your point is your point is taken. And no, we're, we're taking this very, very seriously. It, you know, in part because I think it was alluded to by by Ms. Schroeder early on that in terms of, you know, notwithstanding everything I said about innovation on methane emissions reductions, the things that we take very seriously, you know, all those things have been declining over time for a long time because of because of innovation. Uh, but it remains to be seen what the exact um, what the exact goal of the Biden administration is. If it's if it's simply if it's climate change re reduction, than simply shutting down federal lands in the in the context of the global demand that I showed on those graphs. It's not going to do anything. They will go to places where operators will go to places where there's less risk and where there's more interest. And that includes private land states like North Dakota and Texas and Oklahoma, but it also includes other parts of the world uh, that that are happy to produce. And so, you know, I think the thing about, uh, you know, that's important to remember about federal lands production in Wyoming, uh, it, it is not easy to produce on federal lands in Wyoming. It, and, and as a result of that, production in Wyoming is the safest, it's the most environmentally responsible, it is the most highly regulated production in the world, in the world. If you want to actually work on, on if, if, you, if, you, if it is your passion, is is your life's goal to work on climate change, Okay, I can make an argument that the way to do that is to actually continue production on federal lands where the regulation makes it the safest, most environmentally responsible development in the world. So we're, we're, we're going to be fighting it on, on, on multiple fronts uh, and, and, and in many ways, both in terms of, of, of upfront of vocal advocacy like this right now, in terms of, of uh, behind the scenes communications with our friends and colleagues from other public land states like New Mexico. Keep in mind, Mr. Chairman and Senator Byman, that um, you know, New Mexico, it, from a political standpoint, is the mirror opposite of Wyoming. Entire state is, is statewide electeds are all Democrats and self-described progressive Democrats. 
and they all have very specific policy objectives that you may not agree with, but their policy objectives in New Mexico are entirely dependent upon the revenue from oil and gas. Uh, they may not really like that that's where they get the funding for the things they want to do, but that's where they're getting the funding from for the things they want to do. So we're, we're all in this together uh, on it, and we're going to, to do that advocacy in a, in, in a manner that's uh, jointly with our with our friends and colleagues, and then the litigation. I mean, you you heard. I can't I can't obviously say anything better than than Ms. Schroeder and, and Mr. Dan said about evaluating litigation. The Western Energy Alliance filed a notice of intent. It's um, not um, they, but they like us have to wait to see exactly how it plays out to see where the, the legal angle is. So we're going to do that, and 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 we will like the state of Wyoming and like many other states and our friends and in, in other uh, associations. Uh, we will see where that uh, angle of, uh, of, of legal attack can, can be taken, and we will take it. Well, thank you, Mr. Obermuller. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up so that because uh, we're going to be gaveling in here in about eight minutes. Uh, one, I'd very much like to thank uh, Mr. Dan and, and Ms. Schroeder for, for coming and presenting. We, great information. Uh, we all very much appreciate your expertise and your willingness to share with us. Mr. Obermuller, thank you for for the assist and the hard work getting this set up. Um, I will ask if we could get um, all of our slides um, put together maybe to Mr. Obermuller and then if you would uh, give that to LSO, we'll get those posted. I know we've had a couple of requests for uh, copies of those slides. Uh, we appreciate that information. I have one ask uh, before we before we sign off. And Pete, would you, again, would you, um, anytime uh, any of those notices, requests for comments and public input come out, if you would go ahead and communicate that with this committee, um, and then we'll charge our committee with uh, taking the time to make meaningful comments as they affect our communities. And so that's one step moving forward. So, hey, with that, uh, again, everybody, thank you very much. And uh, let's go finish up our last day this week. And, in this short session and put our thinking caps on over the next couple of weeks.